and we have grandkids coming. And it's amazing to watch how you raise them in church and you raise them in Sunday school and you raise them in children's church and you raise them and you raise them and you raise them up and they know the anointing. They've been under the anointing. They come out of tongue talking homes. They come out of places where you laid hands on them when they got fevers and the fever broke. They know the power of God. They know the word of God. But by the time they go through high school, and come out of college, they come out with all these types of weird. Oh, I'm going to teach it. I got to preach it. I got to preach it. They come out with all types of weird, twisted belief systems where you look at them and be like, who are you and where did you come from? Who got to your head? Who, who messed up your brain? Because we are dealing with pulpits that is allowing the faith to be contaminated. Now, that ain't your problem here. But I'm warning you of some things because, see, what I'm finding out in today's age is the reason the church is so messed up. It's because your pastor ain't the only one you listening to. <laughs> See, this is why all of these saints that are just going to church online, they disturb me. Oh. Because what George Berner also found out is that most people who claim to be online church goers, first of all, 40% or more of them ain't even watching their church. And when they are watching online, they ain't watching their pastor. They're watching a little bit of everybody. And it's hard to raise up saints of God and disciple them when you preach one thing. And then they go out and hit Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and hear one other thing. And we got saints so mixed up, they don't know what to believe. Come on, if I'm preaching half the truth, say preach on preacher. You preaching it. You preaching it. Yes, yeah, yeah, you're preaching it. And so there has to be a clarity brought back to the faith. And while I do not have time to preach on all of the, the different types of synchronistic views that have crept into the church, one of the biggest one and the biggest issue we are having is with this thing called grace. <sighs> he says they've crept in unaware and they've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. Which means they're preaching that God's grace is so amazing and oh it is. Oh how it is. That God's grace is so lavish and oh how it is. That God's grace extends to, to, to no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter who you are, no matter how long you've done it. God's grace is available to you and oh yes it is. But what these preachers have done is that they have maximized grace. By minimizing sin. <laughs> and the Bible declares that both of those things are dealt with together. That I can't maximize grace and minimize sin. But on the flip side, I can't maximize sin and minimize grace. The truth is in the middle. But I want to address what Jude is talking about when he says they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Which means because I'm saved and because of God's grace and mercy and love, then now I have the license to be lewd. Because <laughs> he'll forgive me, you know. Now I want to address this very clearly so you understand something. 
because this must be clearly understood. I'm about to make the holiness people wrong because what they have done is maximize sin and minimize grace. Meaning that through the very grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we have been extended peace with God. And that when you become a believer, according to Ephesians chapter number two, it is by grace you have been saved. It is the gift of God to us. That in the old covenant, None of us could be justified before God without keeping the law. Which means in order to be right before God, you had to cross every T and dot every I. Well, because that was humanly impossible, mankind could not be received in the presence of God. He could not be, he could not be in union with God. He could not be one with God because he could not keep every bit of the law. So in the old covenant, you had to keep all of the law in order to be justified before God. That was humanly impossible because mankind was wicked. Jesus comes on the scene and says, I came to introduce a new covenant. This new covenant doesn't require you to keep everything in the law. I'm going to keep everything in the law. And I am going to be the one justified before God. And then if you will receive me, you get my status with God. And so you don't even get to the Father unless you come through me. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? And because Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe, then when Jesus extended me grace in relationship with him, I get what I get from God, not by what I do, but by what he did. Oh, that's some grace right there. That's grace right there for Jesus to show up to you and say, this ain't even about what you did. This is about what I did. And as long as you're with me, you get my righteousness with God. See, that's grace on another level that God would bring you into righteousness with him where you and I are justified before God because we received Jesus. And it's Jesus that makes us right with God. That's why the Bible says, in him we have redemption. In him we have salvation. In him, it ain't in you, it's in him. Now that's some amazing grace, y'all. The fact that everything you get from God, you get it through Christ Jesus. Now that ought to free some of y'all because you're trying to work for it. And Jesus is telling you, you already got it. <laughs> and you're saying, no, I got to pray for it. Jesus is saying, no, you already got it. You're saying, no, I got to fast for it. Jesus is saying, no, you already got it. You don't need to fast to get it. You need to fast to believe you already got it. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? Fasting ain't going to get you the blessing. You already got the blessing. What fasting will do is get your nervous system out of the way and your emotions out of the way where you get your faith to a point where you grab what God has already done for you. And so I don't mean to bust anybody's bubble in this room who has put a lot of effort into the way you have self-righteously seen yourself. I hate to bust your bubble and tell you that God has done nothing for you because of how good you've been. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's done nothing for you because of how good you've been. He's done everything for you because of how good Jesus was. 
and everything you got, you got it through Jesus. Throw your hands up and say, thank you, Jesus. Because it wasn't my own strength. It wasn't my own prayers. It wasn't my own worship that got it. Jesus got it for me 2,000 years ago. That's why I bless him. That's why I praise him. Because my hope is built on nothing less. Not on myself. It's built on Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ. I'm standing on him if I'm going to get healed I'm going to get it from him if I'm going to get delivered I'm going to get it from him not by my own works 